The mass of talons tightened over her head, the pressure building and the talons digging in. She knew what would come first. The second talon in his grip was pressed against the base of her skull. It would sever her spine and cut out all feeling. The rest of the death would be felt only above the neck. Tears streaked down her cheeks as she clenched her eyes shut, and her mind went into a fury of what-ifs and thoughts about the afterlife. What if darkness awaits for her? She never did anything bad. Would there really be a paradise? She never got to fall in love or have a family of her own. She never even got to find a buck friend. She imagined Wax Seal smiling at her in front of an altar, or maybe someone else at work. Borealis Bolt was very cute. Sure, he had a reputation for fooling around a bit too much, but she always thought he would look good in a tuxedo or something. Her mind continued until she realized the pain was no longer present. Still crying and blubbering, she waited for a sweet release from the nightmare of this dirty, painful world. She looked in desperation for a bright light, but found only darkness. Cold fear shot through her, and she only cried more. This one's not with the rangers. The voice was deep, but surprisingly soft. She opened her eyes, and through her tears she could see the same eyes. Only they looked soft and filled with anger. I don't care. Kill it, and let's move on. Another voice came from a little further away. It was cold, but oddly relaxed, and more than anything, it sounded annoyed. She is unarmed and unarmored. She's not with them. He hefted her up a little and looked at her closer. I don't think she's ever been a threat to anyone. Is this the face of a griffin who cares? The massive griffin looked up behind himself for a moment, before turning back and peering into Lexi's eyes, and to her surprise, he set her down. She couldn't even stand. All she managed to do was hiccup and whimper as she lay there, her heart thundering and testing the full limits of a healthy pony's body. I'm not killing her. He turned back to her and faced towards the other voice. Fine, fine, fine. I'll kill it. She could see from the breath of the massive griffin, one normal-sized gray griffin. The only real features on his body was that he had an eye patch, and what looked like two large grade launchers holstered on his sides, secured to his body with straps that also held a variation of knives and boxes that looked like something akin to saddlebags on his hindquarters. No, I'm not letting you kill her. She didn't do anything wrong. And she's obviously not in condition to do anything wrong either. He stared down the other griffin. While she was still twice the size of the young Kroos, this gray griffin was easily a third of the size of the massive dark brown beast of a griffin. Holy shit, Oso. This is why our missions take so damned long. You keep finding some poor defenseless thing and trying to pamper it and bring it home. He jutted a talon out aggressively at the massive griffin. Lexicon was still plenty petrified with fear, but she put a little at ease, noticing that neither of them drew their weapons or closed in on each other. Neither of them seemed ready to fight over it. They just seemed annoyed and willing to argue over it. Suddenly, a third voice joined in. It was odd and indescribable. Lexicon could only know that it sounded male and possibly old. Oh dear. Well, it seems you cleaned everything up pretty fast. Oh, a survivor. Tyron, I'm proud of you. Shut the fuck up. The one-eyed griffin growled. Lexi felt safe labeling the angry gray one as Tyron. Finally, she could at least, uh, part of the way, find her voice. But it was like she couldn't focus on the new voice. Her shaking hooves suggested her glasses on her nose, but still she could not get a clear look at his face. She could only see green and a sandy brown, but clearly it was a griffin, and she felt she was right on her guess. He did sound older. Oh, I see, Tyron. Let's continue. Don't worry about Oso. Let him do as he wishes. Honestly, though, you don't even need to kill the rangers. Just retrieve the package and let's move on. No. 
If he wants to spare every little thing that gives him puppy eyes, then he can finish up here. Also, you get this site cleaned up and gathered. Then, because you're such a pain in the tail, you go until Susie and debate the terms of the contract. Again. But do not sign anything unless our terms are met. I'm not giving those fur balls a damned thing that they've not earned. He glared at the massive griffin and spat, before taking to the sky once more with one last glare at Lexicon. When that thing finally dies or whatever, get your crap done and meet us at the castle. The green griffin turned towards them, but still she couldn't see his face. He just let out a soft chuckle and tossed the bag to the large griffin, the Lexi labeled as Oso. Then, at a brisk pace, he started off on all fours. It was a little confusing why he didn't fly, like it didn't bother him so. He just continued on without a care in the world. Finally, the griffin Oso turned about and stared down at her. I... I'm sorry. I thought that only rangers were here. We aim to clear them out entirely. They aren't already hostile towards us. He offered his massive talon down to her, and she struggled to get up even with his help, as he was trying to be as gentle as possible. But quickly, one thing rushed to her mind, and she hobbled after it, desperately, on unsteady hooves. Kraus! She ran to a tree where she he'd been thrown against. Even reaching him, she did not quite know what to do. He was hardly breathing, and his mangled arm hung limply at one side. She rummaged through his pouches and found one healing potion like before, but a large form shouted over her. Stepping in, Oso calmly opened Kroos's beak and popped a few berries inside, crushing them against the roof of his beak. He then took the potion from her and poured it into a sturdy-looking syringe. He pressed the air out of it, and then gave it a firm tap before jabbing it in the smaller griffin's neck and firmly pressing the plunger. He then, with a fair amount of finesse, pulled his broken arm until the bones aligned, allowing the limb to set fairly cleanly. Quick, pony. Breathe into his lungs. They are likely collapsed, and as you can see, he's not breathing much at all. He gestured to her with his own beak. I have no lips. She flustered a little, but put it behind her. Quickly, she mouthed his beak and exhaled into the young griffin. It did not take long at all before he woke up, coughing and wheezing. He quickly swallowed and shivered. His eyes blinked rapidly, and he took in the sight of the massive griffin. Flopping around like a fish out of water, he struggled to find his pistol. Despite his unusual size, Zoso was clearly not some lumbering oaf. Watching the revived Kroos flounder for a weapon, Oso pressed the lost pistol into his own bags. He would return to Kroos when he was sure the little griffin would not be openly hostile. Wah! Wah! What? Where? Where am I? What hit us? It... it was a... a hellhound, right? Did I kill it? He continued to cough and struggle to find his pistol. Calm down, little one. There's no hellhound. That was me. And I'm sorry, I thought you were with the rangers. He offered his massive talons to Kroos to help him up. Kroos, however, swatted the offer away. We're not with any fucking rangers. They don't take griffins and the mud ponies too stupid for the rangers to recruit. It was about this time that Lexi stopped cradling his head and let him hit the ground. He said he was sorry. And moreover, he spared us when he noticed we were not his enemy. Even when his friends told him he shouldn't. Then he's stupid and an asshole! Kroos growled up at her, now rubbing his head. And you? He spared you? He grumbled painfully. Like I said, I'm indeed sorry. The rangers attacked on sight, and we have had conflict with them in the past, so we just started taking them out. He stood back a little awkwardly. But, so long as you're okay, I really have to get going. My friends were not lying. I have to finish up here and then move on to keep my schedule. We have a lot of things to do. You can follow if you like, but I would suggest you move along soon. I got to go to some pretty dangerous places. He stood up and his wings stretched a little bit. 
unintentionally showing off what looked like some sort of melee weapons under them. They were long and appeared to be bulbous heads with a simple single edge curved blade coming off at a 90 degree angle. It was like some sort of club mixed with a sickle. Whether it was curiosity or just her need to try and repay his mercy, Lexicon did her best to smile as she asked, What's your job here? Kroos rolled to his paws, but cringed and lay back down, waiting for the potion to finish its work. He was unaware of the berries, but Lexicon wondered if they were some alternative healing method. While Kroos mumbled angrily under his breath, as the pain of his mended limb, Oso put on a smile and sat down. You see, a few weeks ago we heard a pre-war gruel who lived in this area when the bombs fell. We were poking around for a few items and books. Books containing details we needed to know. This location was some sort of research facility. At least that's what our intel says. We set up a meeting with this ghoul, and we were saddened to see that it appeared he did not want to sell the information exclusively to us. But here in the Wasteland, some ponies are all too happy to agree to a deal. Then you just kill you instead of paying you. We arrived on scene to find him dead. So we had to try and figure out where it was he mentioned, and to keep his killers from taking our prize, and simply to take what we paid for. Thankfully, he had the information stored nearby. I mean, we did pay for it, but alas, the Steel Rangers were the ones who killed him, and thus we had to contend with them. Thankfully, most of them were at the old stable, separated, spread out, and looking for a way in. So taking them on was relatively easy. What remained of our initial attack came here, and we moved in to finish them off. Now, here we are. Lexicon nodded, taking in it all and then asking, What's a ghoul? I mean, I know what a ghoul is, but I feel like it's unlikely that it's an evil spirit that's going to sell you information. Oso watched her brow the pony, but then chuckled. <laughs> Undead pony. Other creatures can be ghouls too, but... Basically, when someone soaks up too magical radiation, they die and they become a ghoul. Most, other than looking like a piece of jerky, are pretty normal. But some of them become feral and just eat whatever or whoever they can get their mouths on. Around here, you're more likely to run into feral pony ghouls. But heck, you'll know a ghoul when you see one. And I assume there's a reason you don't know this. She nodded quickly and was finally happy to explain. I was actually here when the bombs fell. I got ushered into a stable and frozen. I woke up and found the stable in ruin. Every pony was dead in there. Well, there was one survivor, but... She shivered, remembering the tongue shooting out of and dragging wax seal into the shadows. He was swallowed and gone before his life had even ended. There are monsters in there. So many monsters. She shivered, and Oso nudged her with a wing. Don't worry, it's all okay. You and your friend will be fine. I mean, it is astounding that you are alive, and actually, I am indeed finding a little hard to believe that you are an actual survivor of the end of the world. But don't worry, it doesn't change many things at all. So long as I am here, and your little friend will not come to harm. Now I have work to do, and technically, you have been here on site longer than me. I don't suppose you could tell me where I can find room 278. It should be in building number 15. Lexicon blinked and stared at him blankly, prompting Oso to speak again. It's okay if you don't know. I can find it on my own. I just need to get through a locked door and search it for a book or two. M what do you mean you don't believe me? Logical Lexi's gears were turning, grinding and getting ready to break, really. She could deal with the coincidence at her safe house in a short while, but at the moment she was burning to find out just how accurate the estimation was. The big griffin's feathers fluffed up and he gave a light shrug, more at her behavior than at her words. Well, it's been over 170 years. I can't say it's impossible for you to be telling the truth, but it just seems unlikely, and your flesh seems rather pristine to be a ghoul. Wha- 
one... one hundred and seventy years. Lexicon's eyes widened in shock. No wonder everything's so run down. A small part of her nearly broke in panic. There really wasn't an equestria out there somewhere anymore. Not to mention that if this level of radiation still existed, then the nuclear assault must have been unrealistically extreme. Even with the defenses in Equestria, there must have been some enough Bellfire bombs to destroy at least every inch of Equestria. And hundreds, if not thousands, or tens of thousands of them made it through. Please tell me that you're joking. This is a very long time, and now no pony ever that I know is still alive? Well... Did you know a stallion named Rusty? Oh, so leveled an eye at her. Rusty Hammers? I think he was the manager of the apartments. Kind of a creep. But he never bothered me. She got back to the older stallion, remembering the dark brown earth pony. He was always watching ponies as they went about their lives. Either he was a stalker or one of the MOM spies. She didn't know which was worse. He also watched her reaction slowly, but continued... He's the one who sold us the details of location, and the possible materials here. Gross laughed, still clenching his beak in pain as he finally pushed himself to his paws. So some greedy pre-war ghoul tells you there is a treasure, and the owner of the treasures coincidentally wake up at the same time, and comes looking to reclaim them? Oso's feathers fluffed again. Reclaim. You own apartment 278. Wow. That is a coincidence. He did not seem very put off by it, but he did not look like a griffin that would be scared or disturbed by much at all. Despite his apparent eagerness to talk and help, he did seem oddly calm, almost empty. Well, this makes our job much easier. Gross hacked and spat what Lexi hoped was the last bit of blood he had misplaced through his brutal attack. Honestly, I'm eager to see if she really is telling the truth. It seems pretty far-fetched, but this will give me some answers. And you and your crap, or whatever. Lexi was just happy that they finally decided to focus on getting to her library. Today was easily the worst of her life. She made a quick note that today counted as her own personal perception of the last 24 hours, which included the end of the world and her introduction into the wasteland. Well, come on, let's go. I have a lot down there, and I think there's a few things you would like down there too, assuming that the other safe rooms have not been broken into. Oso nodded happily, following her. Kroos followed as well, with a fast-paced, limping stride. He tilted his head, wondering what she was talking about. The way she had said it made him seem hopeful, especially since the mayor was unlikely to be able to survive successfully lie in her life. It's just in here. She opened the door with some relief. No pony was inside, and she could see that the safe room was tampered with, but it clearly was not been opened in a very long time. She happily walked in, despite also saying something that was muffled by the walls, and instantly her blood ran cold. She was scared spitless at first, seeing a corpse just propped up like that, but then the rotting pony turned and looked her dead in the eyes. Her legs went limp, and her blood cold. Her lips parted, and she was not sure what happened next, just that Kroos was standing over her, rubbing her e his ears. Ollie balls. You crazy pony. I've never heard of such a thing as high-pitched pathetic screams. If there were still windows, I am certain that they would have been shattered. He offered his taloned grip to her, which she hesitantly took. He easily got to her hooves, and she let out a pitiful whimper. Wh where is... where's the zombie? She hated to admit it, but due to just a few too many books and the occasional movies, she had discovered her immense fear of the undead. She could still see her mother gaze down at her, telling her that zombies were not real. She sniffed and shivered. Of course, the world ends, the Steel Rangers turn evil, and the world's full of slavers. Why not have undead monsters? Ghouls. Crow stared at her, trying to hold in a fair amount of some rather condescending laughter. That was a ghoul. And I mean, I really don't care at all, but they usually take offense to reactions like that. 
Mind you, that you basically deafened him before you wet yourself and passed out. Eh. Is it still there? She looked around, frightened, and Kroos laughed loudly again. He's outside with the turkey, about a thousand feet up. In the wasteland, if you have wings, usually it's a good idea to take conversations with unknowns up high. So if things turn south, all you have to do is let go. I was actually tempted to do that with you when I first saw you. But then your obliviousness made it obvious that you could not possibly be a threat to anything. Rose pulled out his pistol once more. He seemed pleased to have it back. And it was only afterward that Lexi recalled that... It was gone when Kroos woke up and recovered. The obvious conclusion was that the big griffin returned it while she was not paying attention, or when she was unconscious. The mare still shook and shivered, and even let out a soft, audible eep when Oso came back in, ducking under the doorframe. He looked over and shook his head with a deep laugh. He was just hiding in here. He lives here. The poor guy just needed to hide until the rangers left. He came in from the upper floors through the chimney. The huge griffin gave her a sturdy pat on the back. He's gone now. He's gonna wait till we leave. He gestured at Lexicon and to the door. She calmly came over to the door and put in the code, and the door fizzled before weakly smoldering. Oh, the power's probably out. It has been a while without any real maintenance, and the repair talisman's dead. She stared at the locked house and before Oso stepped in with an iron-like grip and simply tore the casing off, and a short amount of rummaging through his bags, he produced a spark battery and rammed it into the door. Instantly, it opened just a hair, and he yanked the battery out before prying the doors open and the rest of the way, and looking down at the extremely well-preserved room. Ah, perfect! Nothing's been touched! She let out a happy squee as she rummaged about, taking everything she could go without. Two changes of clothes, a fair amount of books, and a few trinkets. Oso, however, began shoveling books into his bags, while clearly looking for something very specific. First edition history of the Crystal Empire. First edition star swirl of beardeds, world's artifacts and ponies. Second edition supernat... Oso's talons gripped a book and pulled it out of her hand, bags. Before she had a chance to even say a word, he quickly began to sift through the pages. This is it. This is what the rangers, or we, were here for. Aye, pack up all the books you can. We'll keep what we can and sell the rest. In the right hooves, you can make a boatload off of any book. Especially books this well-preserved. Lexi seemed a tad worried. She had checked that Star Swirl's guide out from the untouched library. Mostly just books untouched by the Ministry of Image. That was really the foundation of Project Urbonum. She thought about asking for it back, but she rolled the thought around a bit and decided against it, considering that he was only here for it. It was his own kindness that made him not kill her, but he did seem to be the kind that was still under orders. She didn't want to see if he was more loyal to the goals of his group or her, a mare he literally met less than an hour ago. So, mud pony, where's this? Thing you said that I would want. She looked over at him, and he picked through the books, only taking a few things and checking out how neat and tidy the room had been set. Oh, next door. Lexi was so lost in the feeling of suddenly being back home, she'd almost forgotten for a second that the world had ended. I'll show you. Um, also, can you unlock the door when we exit? The massive griffin nodded once gave another sweep of the room before coming out and helping her lock the door once more. He slid the metal cover over the locking mechanism and bent the steel into place, ensuring that nothing but his talons or explosives would remove it again. Anyone who knew enough to blow apart it would know that if they did so, they would never get into the room. The next stop really was next door, though a heavily rotted-out floor made certain that making their way across the room was not easy for Lexi. However, much to her dislike, Oso just picked her up and flew across the ruined floor, his wings crashing and brushing and knocking either side of the room with his enormous wingspan. 
Reaching the door, she could see that it had an immense amount of scratches over it, and a few blackened marks. But soon, Lexicon was able to happily punch in a code, and was overjoyed to see that this door opened without any trouble. Okay, guys, this place belonged to a total dunce. All he did was drink Sparkle Cola and rant about the end of the world and some conspiracies. Well, the end of the world did come, but he was wrong about everything else. I hope. She smiled, pushing into the room, followed closely by the two griffins. Every wall had a dozen and a half shelves of full bottles of Sparkle Cola. But what really caught Kroos's eye was the result of a prior resident not knowing just how valuable bottle caps would become. There was a hefty amount of bottle caps in the corner, and dozens of dozens of untouched Sparkle Colas on every shelf. Kroos instantly went for the pile and began his thing. She didn't mind. She was there for two reasons. And she found both of them just inside. A small 10 millimeter sidearm and a supply of emergency military rations. MREs, she remembered them being called. She didn't want to take the pistol, but she felt that she would have to be armed at some point. She did her best to stock up on everything she could, and then logic, not so much survival, but logic told her to eat and drink to her heart's content. The extra calories were a good thing, considering she had no idea when next she would eat, despite what her little dandy Lady Lexi said. Oso and Kroos, both happily done with their looting, then exiting the room just the same as the last. With everything they could carry, she looked to the south and sighed happily, before Kroos pulled her to the side. Hey, um, I don't suppose we can go with this guy until we have a clean getaway? I mean, so long as he's not trying to kill us, ten feet from him is the safest place you can get. But I want you to remember, if he does decide to attack or anything, for any reason, I do not want to fight with him. Which I will have to do if you piss him off. So, yeah, don't piss him off, please. She just shook her head. No worries. Pissing off any pony is not on my list of to-do things. Right now, I just need to know where to go and how we should get there. No need to worry, little ones. I won't kill you unless you give me a valid reason to. He pulled a magazine to Kroos's pistol from his bags and offered it to the much smaller griffin. Quick tip. Don't just assume someone can't hear you. I was not, and to some level, am still not convinced you fear me enough to not try something. Kroos quickly checked his gun to notice that the magazine he had in his pistol was empty, and with a grumpy growl, he swapped the magazine. Oso did not seem affected. You can't blame me. And honestly, I'm surprised that you didn't notice. I mean, I don't even enjoy guns, but I can tell a loaded weapon from an unloaded one easily. Shut up, young grown turkey. His body language truly did betray his fear of the massive griffin. Oso just chuckled and turned, about ducking out of the doorway and up into the cloudy sky. Well, my group has certain interests, and as of now, I have to go to the far north. You're welcome to come. I could use the company, and honestly, if you can stomach it, it's a valuable experience. You might not even need your little bird here after we're done. And I'm certain that if we succeed, you and my friends will offer you a place to live, safe and sound, for the rest of your life. The massive griffin found a happy smile and a calm gesture with his talons. He had not been so clearly intimidating on ten levels, Lexicon would have called it a gesture pleasantly inviting. Cross's eyes narrowed. I'm not your little... And about your... friends. You're not with the talons. I certainly would have heard about you, and you don't have any marks. He looked to Lexi and nudged her softly. They were all griffins, right? She nodded quickly. Yes, him, a one-eyed male named Tyron, and I think an older brown and green male, I think? And they operate out of some sort of castle. Oso's feathers fluffed up as he regarded her. You have good ears, little one. But in case you meet people like this in the future, don't openly speak of such things. They might take it as you knowing too much about them. Lexicon paled, but Crow stepped in again. So what is your little group? No one I've heard of before, and the way you 
clean through those rangers would imply that your group is really something to take note of. Oso just chuckled and shook his head. Don't worry about it. I doubt you would know of us anyway. He began to walk at a brisk pace, and Lexicon quickly followed him. Soon after, so did the still frustrated Kroos. After only a few moments of silence, Lexicon's curiosity prompted her to annoy the Griffins with questions. Though, unlike Kroos, Oso seemed happy to answer the questions. For the most part, the questions focused around political figures, cities, and more or less just how much the world was left. Surprisingly, Oso was rather well versed in the last 170 years of equestrian history. There are still zebras running around doing their thing, but honestly, I haven't seen them myself. The only thing that can be considered as a proper leftover part of the old world is the Enclave, and they're a whole type of ugly. Yes, the Pegasus, right? You touched on them a little earlier. If the state of the world was not so far down the drain, already she would have smiled at such a wealth of new knowledge. Yes, and aside from taking the skies from us, they have a little tyrannical dictatorship up there. In the last few years especially, we've seen a few of their exiles. Dashites, they call them. He gave a look to say this affected him for some level. Dashite? You mean like the Ministry Mayor of the MOA? Or is that just a coincidence? She looked over the next hill, only to sigh at the visual treat of more hills. Yes, actually. Rainbow Dash was only the Ministry Mayor known to survive the bombs. But she still pissed off the group that eventually became the Enclave, and... Well, it's safe to say that they show just about as much love and tolerance to her as they do to everything else that manages to get up there. Gross yawned loudly, rolling his eyes, and he bolted up to the top of the trees. It was clear he was just annoyed with the constant chatter, but his constant glances back down reminded her that he had sworn to protect her. Lexicon, however, was more than happy to continue popping off question after question. So, what's north? Are you going to the Crystal Empire? Oh, wait, what happened to the Empire? A small glimmer of hope welled up within her, but it flickered out when she saw the look on his face. Sorry. They just up and vanished after the bombs. The only thing known about that place was the prince and princess did not make it out. But at least one of their children did. We don't know who or what happened to them. They had a vault or two up there, but no pony knows if they made it or if they died in the bombing. However, there's a surplus of rumors. And of the many times I've been up north, I've seen a lot of suggesting that the area is simply far too dangerous to snoop around. No, we are not going to that area. In fact, we are going to be taking a four- or five-day detour to try and avoid that area. We are after something somewhere in... Yakyakistan used to be. Lexicon blinked and looked back up at him. Where it used to be? Yes, when the war started to hit its peak, the Yaks thought it would be a good idea to try and do some fighting on their own. Sadly, when the bombs fell, they tried to ambush a small trade caravan of Susie. You don't attack the Susie. Not even Equestria, in all of its desperation, even thought about trying to squeeze them for supplies. Not to mention their lands are destroyed, and just beyond frozen death. He shook his head and chuckled. Sorry, I get sidetracked from time to time. There is a small group of Suzy who live there now. It's a compli complicated story, but they do business with me and my friends. However, they are a little odd at times with us at the moment due to a disagreement. I get that impression that your friend Tyron is to blame? She gave a worried smile and he chuckled. Yes, I think it would be fair to say that he is the disagreement. Also chuckled, turning to a deep laugh, but he shifted his attention upwards as Kroos descended and firmly landed before him. Pasternville is just ahead. We can sell all this garbage and pick up a thing or two that we'll need. He looked the griffin over before continuing. And I do hope you plan on carrying her. I don't want to walk that distance. Walking to stupid yak land will take forever. Oso laughed again. Of course. 
However, there is a fair stretch you won't really want to fly through. There's a system of caves, just a few beasties to get rid of, and it's our safest route. Unless you want to traverse the glowing tundra. Rose cringed and Lexicon tilted her head in a question. I take it that it's glowing for a reason. Crow shook his head. The intense level of magical radiation is a huge threat, yes. But the biggest problem is the tundra used to be a place with a ton of wildlife. Lots of big predators. Now they're even bigger and plenty mutated. Each one unique and exceedingly powerful. It's not impossible to get through without dying of radiation. However, chances are that you'll be eaten near instantly the moment you go through the glowing snow. But what's up there that needed to be bombed? If I recall correctly, just about everything up there, aside from the Crystal Empire, is just frozen wasteland. Well, most part, it's just weathered patterns that brought the vast majority of the magical radiation to that spot. Also, about 15 Balefire bombs were thrown at the Empire. The fallout from all those, of which were diverted or destroyed before impact, still got swept into the tundra's weather. There's talk about something out there preventing the storm from dissipating and releasing that massive amount of radiation and filth into the rest of the north. But honestly, we don't know everything. And even the things we do believe cannot fully be proven. They're just incredibly likely. Lexicon mumbled a little in worry and quickly started to trying to figure out more questions for the large griffin. But her train of thought was derailed as they crested the next hill and took in what she currently passed for a city. Pasternville, she remembered, was a relatively new city. But this was a ruin of a ruin put back together with tarps and rotting plywood. What little stone structures had not been reduced to rubble were so cracked and crumbled it reminded her of a story about the three fillies and the big bad timber wolf. She was so tempted to just walk up and blow on it to see if it would collapse. The only thing that kept her from doing so was her fear that it actually would. In this way, we can dump off most of our useless stuff here. Also hefted a heavy talon down one of the back alleys. A back alley that she would never have gone down, even if there was ten royal guards within shouting distance. However, as the hulking griffin advanced, the shifty-looking types skittered away like roaches. She quickly noted the usefulness of having a giant griffin on her side. Come on now. He waved and she nodded, following closely. Rose too followed, but remained extra vigilant. She took in how vastly different they acted, but she was confident that Oso was able to afford with ease and calmness as he walked. He seemed uncaring about what could possibly be around the next corner. All the while, Kroos checked and rechecked every corner, every dark spot, every door, and every window. Being so much smaller and younger, he had to be relying on training and excessive caution. Lysacon's focus crumbled when she heard a very annoying grumble. Kroos looked over and chuckled. What's wrong, big guy? Can't do doors? He chuckled louder, but silenced himself and looked away when Oso stepped back and turned around, letting Lexicon see the small door he could not possibly fit through. Um, I suppose we could just go to another shop? She hoped her suggestion would not offend Oso or continue Kroos's giggling. No, this is a place that buys this sort of merchandise. Here, just go in with Kroos. I'll be at the door. If anything happens, I'll remove this wall and enter to help. He tapped the poorly constructed wall, but looked back when some pony cleared their throat. I'd really appreciate it if you didn't do that. A pair of annoyed eyes leveled across the alley. Lexi was a bit startled, but not nearly as much as Kroos, who stumbled and almost fell over when he jumped out at the sudden appearance. The stallion was a unicorn. Soft gray and even softer blonde hair, with dull blue eyes. His voice was thick and an accent Lexi couldn't quite replace. He was dressed in a very well-worn open trench coat. What's the matter, bird? Did I scar ya? Horse growled at the unicorn, laughed, but came to the door and fiddled with the lock before entering and abruptly closing the door behind him. Also stared for a moment raising his talons to knock on the door, wondering if the unicorn was going to just ignore them. 
But quickly, there was a loud click, and the entire wall slowly scooted to the side, giving more than enough room for Oso to enter the shop. I remember you, big bird. Where's that knobhead of the one-eyed bird? He grumbled, but he nodded to Oso, and then Kroos. Did you trade him in for the plonker? Oh, I only wish. Oso chuckled, and laid his bag on the table quickly, sliding about all of his supplies and books he aimed to turn in. Likewise, Kroos also did so, and took a few glances from Kroos before Lexi followed suit. She didn't have anything in her bags that she wanted to trade. The business ritual began. Lexi had seen it before, and even now, over one and a half centuries later, the unicorn looked over everything and did a pretty good job of looking unimpressed. But she could see that his eyes shifted and focused, his irises contracting slightly whenever she saw something that looked a little more intact than the other stuff. All that changed when he looked over at her bags. His eyes froze, locked into one of her books. He wasn't even trying to hide his amazement. Or perhaps he couldn't. I don't suppose you'd be willing to part with this one. I'll give you a good price for it, love. A really good price. Instantly, her hooves scooped it up. She'd easily followed his eyes to the book. It was one of her favorites. Implementations of Earth Pony Machines and Magical Prowess. It was a part of a larger series, personally written by one pony who had spent a great deal of time wandering around and experimenting since long before the war. It really was a one-of-a-kind, and she had to pay five months' earnings for it. It wasn't exactly the pride of her collection, but it was one of her favorites. N no, sorry. This one's not for sale. I can sell just some other stuff and some of these, and... She looked over her gear, but a set of talons slapped down at about halfway through the pile. Oh, this. Trust me, mud pony. It's not anything you can't get more of. You move like a slug, and if you have to run, you'll lose it all or your life. Do either half now, or all, and your life later. Gross gave her an annoyed stare. Grumbling, she nodded but kept her books close. At least all the first editions. Oso smiled and gave her a soft pat on the head. Don't worry, little one. Just sell what you can. You have a big choice ahead of you, and you will certainly want to be ready for whichever you choose. Cecilov, I'll give you new extra-large saddlebags and fill them with everything you want in the store, just for that book there. Also gave a firm stare at the unicorn, then at Lexi, reading the look in her eyes. It's a good deal. He looked over her reaction and smiled. Sorry, buddy. Looks like the book's not for sale. The unicorn opened his mouth again, but before, so, much as a peep escaped, Oso rolled his head softly from one shoulder to the other, releasing a disturbingly loud, wet set of pops as he flexed his talons, quite literally gouging the concrete floor. The point was made, and the shopkeeper cleared his throat with a smile. Anything else? Oso looked at Lexi and smiled gesturing to the rack in the back. Three boxes of 10 millimeter, one armor piercing, one high explosive, and one hollow point. Oh, and a cleaner's kit. Unicorn nodded and grumbled as he fetched the rest of the supplies and cashed them out. Also glanced at the pile of caps and supplies for what was being traded before tapping twice on the counter. Unicorn looked a little unsure, but tapped once. Also then tapped twice again this time with the tip of his talon digging firmly into the counter with an apparent ease. He gulped and nodded, pushing a little more caps on the counter with a sigh. Oso scooped up and distributed things among the three of them, giving a surprising amount to Kroos and Lexicon, before heading a ways back out to the shop. He sighed and sat down firmly before looking over both of them. All right. I have given you enough in reparations for are less than pleasant introductions. Now, if I'm right, you have to make a choice, little pony. You can come with me, or you can try and survive with this little one here. He patted Kroos, who angrily swatted away the massive talons before spouting out, What do you mean, enough reparations? You nearly killed me! 
and I also saved your life. Escorted you to the nearest city and helped you make a good profit with your loot. If I'm being honest, my services are exceedingly normally expensive. And getting Tyron to not kill you is actually very risky for me. So, it would be fair if I took everything you owned and left you without a cap or a scrap of clothing to your names. But I'm nice, so I'm calling it even. Now, if I'm being even more nice and offering you not only continued safety within my presence, but the possibility of finding a good home, you can come with me, prove yourself worth the effort, and we will continue to give you a place to stay until you die of old age. A little griffin friend here can come as well, but I have a feeling that he wants to get out of here as soon as possible. It's up to you. The road ahead is easy. Not easy, but hard. He looked at her and spoke three words which she could not help, but to at very high level both fear and believe. It is worth it. Crow scoffed loudly. Oh yeah, let's get right on being your personal servants or whatever. Eh, hey, cannon fodder, cheap. Call it a day. He laughed and looked at Lexicon. Lexi, however, simply stared. She couldn't place it, but something was calling to her, the way he said it. In the wasteland, called to her in the voices of the millions who died that day when she ran for her life to the stable. There was something going on that she couldn't quite grasp. Her lips moved silently, working the words out again. It's worth it. She didn't know if it was the promise of safety afterwards, or something within her seeing more in his words. She knew for certain it wasn't a thirst for adventure. A talon repeatedly tapped her head with increased speed. It's taking too long for you to give the obvious answer. She looked at him for a moment, then back at Oso and surprised herself. Yes. Footnote. No level up. Try fighting more. You may now travel with both Kroos and Oso as your companions.